Welcome guys, it's Bio 120, and today we're going to start chapter 46. So, I'm looking at my syllabus, and I wanted to just mention that we just finished chapter 17. We're not going to cover chapter 18 at all. And we're going to move right into chapters 46 and 47, and those will be the last two chapters we cover for the semester. Chapter 46 is a biggie, but so I'm breaking it up into four segments. Um, one segment will be markedly longer than the others. And I think that's it. Oh, here's a joke. My kids were talking about jokes, and one of them said, I have a great biology joke. So the question is... Um, who helped the Israelites cross the semi-permeable membrane? Osmosis. <laughs> Get it? Osmosis? Osmosis. Anyway, um, that's the joke of the day, and we're going to get to chapter 46. We'll go ahead and get started. And remember, there'll be uh, an online quiz covering chapter 46 material as well. All right, let's move to our PowerPoint. So here's our PowerPoint slides. And, okay. <clears throat> Chapter 46 is on reproduction. It goes really well with our topics on um, mitosis, meiosis, meiosis in particular, and on genetics. Because when we're talking about um, passing on of traits, we're obviously talking about the fact that animals reproduce and plants reproduce as well. All organisms reproduce and pass on their traits, but we're focusing in chapter 46 on animal reproduction. So we'll just start right up. This chapter, you may have to write notes along, like on the side. I, I left, I, I did this chapter a little bit differently, so you're going to have to kind of fill in a few notes here, okay? So it turns out there's different kinds of uh, animal reproduction. Some organisms reproduce asexually. That is, they make exact copies of themselves most of the time. <laughs> this is kind of confusing. Asexual reproduction is rapid, it's simple, and it's a good way to make more, more offspring, all right, without having to have a mate. There are several different kinds of asexual reproduction. One of them is called fission, and uh, in fission, it's not really... Yes, fission is fine. It's essentially taking and splitting an organism into two organisms, just dividing it. And this sometimes happens with corals. So it, this is a picture of polyps in coral. If you've ever seen coral, um, Petoskey stones are corals. You know, those little hexagonal shaped structures all have little animals, come, polyps, growing out of them when they're alive. These Sometimes what will happen in a coral is it will simply break in half. Fission. So you end up with two organisms. Budding is another way to make copies of yourself. And what typically happens in budding is a small piece of the organism will separate from the rest. A small piece is called the bud of an organism. And so here we've got a picture of a hydra. A hydra is uh, similar to... Um, in the same group of organisms as jellies, or jellyfishes, they used to be called, right? Jellies. And um, you can see that they have these waving tentacles like a jelly would have, except they're stationary. And in hydras, there are freshwater hydras, by the way. In hydras, a small growth will occur on the organism, and we call it a bud, and it will fall off and grow into its own new organism. So we've got budding as a way to produce exact copies of yourself easily without having a, a reproductive partner. Don't need it. And um, another example of asexual reproduction is called fragmentation and regeneration. And so fragmentation and regeneration is um, if a piece of you falls off, it can regenerate into a whole new organism. There are organisms like this. They're called flatworms. Or they're in the um, the, in the group called platyhelminthes. Phylum platyhelminthes are flatworms. They usually look brown, and we see them in pond water, kind of pond scum. You can cut this thing into you know, 10 or 12 different ways, and it, each part will grow back into a complete identical organism, genetically identical at least. The same is true with some um, types of sea stars and with uh, 
earthworms is another one. Okay, so some organisms reproduce asexually. There's one more version of asexual reproduction, which is funky, and we want to talk about it briefly. It's called parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is sometimes called virgin birth. It's also defined as the development of an embryo from an unfertilized egg. Now, I've got a list of lots of different organisms that that use parthenogenesis, at least some of the time. Many of these organisms actually reproduce sexually, sometimes. And sometimes they reproduce with this asexual mechanism called parthenogenesis. So we would call these individuals facultative parthenogenesis, or the animals that can do, can do parthenogenesis when they have to, right? Parthenogenesis, then, the development of an embryo from an unfertilized egg. In these groups of animals, um, if they are obligate parthenogens, there's really only females producing eggs, and those eggs develop into more offspring. Right? There are some groups of um, rotifers, and that's a picture right there of one of them, uh, rotifers who are entirely parthenogenic, and they species that have been parthenogenic for, we think, you know, millions of years and are doing just great. They just reproduce by making eggs that are unfertilized, and those just develop into new little rotifers. I like Komodo dragons as an example of a vertebrate that sometimes uses parthenogenesis. Okay, so for most vertebrates reproduce sexually. Komodo dragons are these huge um, lizards, right? We have some at the John Ball Zoo, if you've ever gone there, you've probably seen the Komodo dragons. Normally, they reproduce sexually, okay? Um, males and females, and you, the males will fertilize the uh, female eggs. The females will then take care of the fertilized eggs. It's all good. But researchers have found in a number of zoos around the world, and most recently, I believe, in Tennessee, in a Tennessee zoo, that female Komodo dragons that have either never mated never seen a male, or that have mated with a male but, but didn't get pregnant from that male, produce eggs, and th some of those eggs develop into offspring. Crazy, huh? So an unfertilized egg will grow into a little baby Komodo dragon. How does this happen? And are they exact clones of mom? So is she making more female Komodo dragons? That would make sense, right? It's not exactly right. Uh, by the way, Komodo dragons live in little islands in uh, places like Indonesia, okay? Here's a cute picture of a baby. Oh, this guy is cute. This guy is so cute, isn't he? Oops. Oh, okay. I'm trying to get to my marker here. Okay. In any case, sex determination in Komodo dragons is kind of funky, and it affects in how we think about parthenogenesis in Komodo dragons, and it's just worth it's just cool, so it's worth mentioning. So, in Komodo dragons, the sex they have sex chromosomes, just like you know mammals do, but their sex chromosomes are different. The female has two different sex chromosomes. This is like birds. The female has a Z chromosome and a W chromosome. The male has two Z chromosomes. So, when he makes sperm, he donates a Z all the time. When she makes eggs, she either donates a, a, a W or a Z, right? And then they come back together to make either they make um, ZZ males or ZW females. Okay, well, if a female has not seen a male or mated with a male in, in a long, long time, what will happen is the female will continue to make her eggs. And so when she makes eggs, you know, she makes uh, W eggs and Z eggs. But we think what happens as she makes these eggs is, and we'll talk about this, um, as she makes an egg, uh, the last division of meiosis involves the splitting apart of two cells, right? Uh, and one of the cells is much smaller than the other. It's called a polar body, and the, oopsie, and the uh, cells can, will be identical, at least with respect to their um, their sex chromosome to each other. 
Now, normally that polar body just disappears. It's never fertilized, it just goes away. But in a female who hasn't seen a male in a long time, this polar body will fertilize the egg. It'll act like a sperm and fertilize the egg. And so we will get a fertilized egg that has two W chromosomes. That's nothing. That'd be like two Y chromosomes in humans. Doesn't mean anything. That, that embryo is not going to grow. But this embryo over here, guys, now has two Z chromosomes. It's like a male. And it starts to grow and develop, even though it wasn't fertilized by a sperm. And it develops into males. So what happens with these female Komodo dragons that haven't made it in a long time, they, their eggs may undergo parthenogenesis, and she produces a whole group of young males. Uh, in Tennessee just recently, a female laid, and a female gave birth to or gave, laid eggs that developed into three males, and that happened in the last few months, and they tested them to see if they were, in fact, based on her genetics only or another male, and they were just from her. So it's kind of cool. So she kind of, researchers think that this is possibly adaptive because Komodo dragons live in on lots of small islands. And if a female Komodo dragon sort of washed up on a new island and was, un, um, was alone on that island, she could essentially populate the whole island with her parthenogenic male offspring, right? She could make parthenogenic male offspring. Later, she could mate with them got a whole island of uh, new Komodo dragons. They're all genetically pretty darn similar, but still pretty interesting. Okay, so that's parthenogenesis, kind of funky. It's a form of asexual reproduction that results in not quite clones of the female, but organisms that are genetic, that have the same genetic material as just one female. All right, sexual reproduction is a uh, uh, most common in the animal world, right? So in sexual reproduction, we have two special sex cells. They're called gametes, and they come together to form a new individual. There's two types of gametes, and the two types of gametes are always called the female and the male. The female gamete is always the larger gamete, by definition, and the non-mobile or non-motile, it doesn't move, gamete. In the male gamete, the sperm, is smaller, by definition, and it's the mobile gamete. It moves, it has a flagellum, right, or several flagella to, to move around. And there are different forms of sexual reproduction. The one that's most common is biparental reproduction. You've got two parents, two sexes that each produce one type of gamete. So you've got a female sex producing eggs and a male sex producing sperm and the two gametes come together. <clears throat> we also have hermaphrodites. Now, I can't even say this word right here. Hermaphroditism. Hermaphroditism. Yeah, try it. Try it at home. Um, hermaphrodites are animals that have both male and female reproductive structures and make both male and female gametes. So let's write down reproductive structures. You could fit that in there better than I can. And they make both male and female gametes. Hermaphrodites then can make eggs and can make sperm. If you're a hermaphrodite, there's all different kinds of hermaphrodites out there. Uh, lots of interesting, fun types of hermaphrodit hermaphroditism. That's a hard word. So let's look at a couple, just because I think they're just exciting. And it's worth, like, it's just worth being excited about all the diversity in the world, right? So some hermaphrodites are simultaneous hermaphrodites. That is, they are simultaneously able to make um, eggs and sperm. So they have reproductive structures. They have a testes and they have an ovary, and they, they're pumping out eggs and sperm at the same time. So if you're a simultaneous hermaphrodite, you really don't need anyone else, right? But um, And so many, many simultaneous hermaphrodites are self-fertilizing. They fertilize their own eggs. So they use their own sperm to fertilize their eggs. Lots of snails fall into this category. 
How adaptive would that be, man? Oh, I'm looking around for a partner. Oh, well, I don't need a partner to sexually reproduce. I've got my own sperm on hand. I've got my own eggs on hand. Boom. I'm done, right? So self, selfing simultaneous hermaphrodites will fertilize themselves. But most simultaneous hermaphrodites actually are outcrossing simultaneous hermaphrodites. They actually find a partner. And when they find a partner, they donate sperm to that partner. That partner donates sperm to them. And when they, so they essentially, each partner donates sperm, fertilizing the other partner's eggs. Uh, you're probably familiar with earthworms. Earthworms do this all the time. So when two earthworms are mating, they'll come up side by side to each other and they'll each donate sperm to each other. And uh, that will fertilize their eggs, they'll lay an egg sac, and they'll move on. But they each are making sperm and eggs. There are some vertebrates that fall into this category. A lot of the hermaphrodites in the vertebrate world are fish. Lots of fish um, examples here, and that's why I've got them. I've got lots of pictures here. One of the um, groups of fishes that are outcrossing hermaphrodites are chalk basses uh, or other um, Atlantic chalk bass is the one that I've got a nice little picture of right here. These guys, um, there are a whole group of organisms that are closely related that do this, but they, these guys have a really unique system. So usually in the fish kingdom, reproduction is preceded by courtship, and a male will typically find a female. He will court her with a specific kind of dance and encourage her to lay her eggs, and then he'll fertilize the eggs. And if you are a hermaphrodite, you're making both eggs and sperm, and your partner's making eggs and sperm. So how does this work? Well, it turns out that in chalk basses, when two individuals come to each other, one of them will be the male partner initially and do the courtship dances of a male, and the other one will act as a female. She'll drop a few eggs, he'll fertilize them, and then they'll switch roles. This one will become the female, and this other one will become the male. I'm sorry, this one will become the male, and the other one will become the female. And now our other individual will drop eggs, and, and the second individual will, will fertilize them. Researchers think that these animals are pretty, pretty cautious, and, and they've developed this kind of interesting way of mating where they don't lay all of their eggs at one time. They lay just a little packet that needs to be fertilized. Then the other fish lays a little packet to be fertilized. And that's really interesting. Why do they do this? And they, they keep mating with each other over and over, over the course of a day or two days. They think that um, they're kind of making sure that, they, that they're preventing cheaters from happening. In, the, in any world, actually, um, making sperm is cheap. You know, sperm are a dime a dozen. You can make a lot of sperm for very little cost, but making eggs is expensive. And so when two chalk basses get together, one of them doesn't want the other to cheat. If, if one of them drops all of, her, all of her eggs and then the other comes in and, and fertilizes the sperm but then leaves, it's much cheaper to be a male in this relationship. So, so in order to prevent cheaters, it seems that this little um, back and forth of mating multiple times, releasing just a little packet of eggs has evolved uh, so that cheaters aren't going to happen. Um, it's kind of cool. Okay, so you can be a simultaneous hermaphrodite, or you could be a sequential hermaphrodite. Sequential hermaphrodites are animals that have the ability to change sex throughout their lifetime. So they might start out as one sex and then develop into another sex over time. Okay, If you are a sequential hermaphrodite, then um, there are different versions of this. There's actually three versions. I've only got two written down. A lot of these animals are showing up. A lot of vertebrate fishes that are reef fishes. So I'm just going to list off a few. 
are in fact sequential hermaphrodites like wrasses, parrotfishes, swamp eels. Um, we've got anemone fishes in this group as well. So lots of reef fishes. All right, so here's uh, the two different things that can happen. You could be a protogynous hermaphrodite. Proto means first or before. And gynous is like OBGYN, that's a female, first female. So in sequential protogynous hermaphrodites, the animals are, the small animals are females. They start out females and they can become male. This system typically evolves when there is one larger male who kind of has a harem of females that he protects and defends and mates with solely. So a large male can defend and protect uh, a whole group of smaller females and he gets sole access to mate with them. But if he dies, what happens? If he dies, one of the larger females in the population will behaviorally become a male, like very quickly. She will start acting like a male within a day or two. And within a couple of weeks, her gonads will change from being ovaries to being sperm. And she will turn into a, a reproductively active male, the large male then that kind of um, is the harem owner, if you will, of this group of females. So protogynous hermaphrodites seem to evolve in a species in which you've got one male in, and many females in the group. And we're not exactly sure why, when a male disappears, why, why does one female then become a male? We think that the big male is probably suppressing, like is probably sending out pheromones that suppress the um, development of maleness in the other females. And as soon as he's gone, that suppression is removed and now one of the bigger females starts acting and being a male over time, can physically change. Pretty cool. All right, protoandrous is the opposite direction. So first male, then female. These are called uh, slipper limpets. And with slipper limpets, the smallest animals are males. And as they grow and develop, they may become females. Their mating system is funky. Um, you might see like five or six slipper, slipper limpets piled up on top of each other. The one on the very bottom is a female. Okay, so this one down here is the female. And these piling up on top are males trying to mate with her. And what happens if she dies is the, the one that's on the very bottom will likely be, develop into a female. And then the others can keep mating with that female. Okay, here's the last one that I have for you that's uh, kind of funky. Um, clownfishes are protoandrous hermaphrodites. Clownfishes like what we saw in Finding Nemo. And so, uh, bad news guys, the story of Finding Nemo didn't quite probably happen, I mean, probably wouldn't have happened quite that way. So remember in Finding Nemo, actually in anemone fishes, we'll often see in um, one anemone, a uh, small group of fishes living. So one female that's larger, a male, and maybe some juveniles in the group, possibly several small ma several males that are adult. So we had Nemo's little family with um, Nemo's dad, Nemo's mom, and him, right? He's the juvenile. Nemo's mom is the big female she gets she gets killed right and so nemo's dad you know uh nemo's dad uh becomes you know this great father figure for nemo etc cetera, etc cetera. but in reality what would have happened in this situation is let's say nemo's mom gets killed when nemo's mom gets killed then uh, when the large female in the group gets killed or leaves then the largest male in the group will likely become a female and probably mate with um, the young males in the group. All right, let's say this all over again. When Nemo's mom died, then Nemo's dad likely developed into a female, became Nemo's mom, but then, this is creepy, Nemo's 
dad who became Nemo's mom would probably mate with individuals in the area. So that would be Nemo. This is really scary. And, and, and that's why I'm sure that um, Pixar didn't want to didn't want to deal with that kind of mess. So they kind of faked it. Anyway, um, that's just a fun little story about protoandrous hermaphrodites. So lots of fishes are hermaphrodites, kind of interesting. Um, so to be a hermaphrodite, to be a true hermaphrodite requires being reproductively functional, reproductively functional. And there aren't very many vertebrates that can be both male and female functionally at the same time. Okay, oh, or even simultaneously, uh, sequentially. One more thing in this part of our uh, video, fertilization. So fertilization is important. Obviously, it's critical for sexual reproduction. The union of the egg and the sperm is what fertilization means. So we've got uh, uh, an egg, a sperm that come together. You get a fertilized egg. We call that a zygote, right? And there's different kinds of fertilization. So there's external fertilization and internal fertilization. And it turns out that there are some requirements for each of these to be successful. Um, when we think about fertilization, externally fertilizing organisms, which organisms use external fertilization? Well, clearly I've got frogs on the little list there because here's some wood frogs in Ohio mating. External fertilization, you see it in lots of fish, right? A lot of fish, um, amphibians. What requirements do they have? Now, eggs and sperm are pretty fragile. If you try to use external fertilization in dry land, you might be in trouble. External fertilization requires keeping the egg and the sperm wet or moist, right? Keeping the egg and the sperm from drying out. And so um, organisms that use external fertilization are doing it in the water or near water or in a watery place, you know, a pond, a swamp, a lake, a, an ocean, etc. Timing is also important for external fertilization because you don't want to just release your eggs into the ocean and have no sperm to fertilize them, right? Um, things like sea urchins do just release their eggs into the environment. How do they know when sperm are going to be around? So timing is important. For some organisms, um, they may use things like time of day, or they may use temperature of the water for identifying when to release their gametes. Other organisms use elaborate courtship mechanisms. So lots of fish, like I said, are going to be courting each other. So the male's going to do a little dance and going to check out a female, and the female's going to be like, I don't know if I like you, but okay. And eventually, they'll, they'll be synchronized so they're ready. The female can drop her eggs, the male can lay the, uh, can fertilize the eggs um, by laying, by releasing sperm and all as well. A successful mating if you will. So courtship rituals become really important for lots of animals that do external fertilization. It's true of frogs as well. So f this is a picture of um, some wood frogs and we uh, found a lot of wood frogs in when I went to, over spring break, I went to Ohio, we saw wood frogs calling, calling, the males call and the females are attracted to that call. And the females will eventually arrive in an area and the male will jump on her and hold on to her until she lays her, until she releases her eggs. That's called amplexus. And when she releases her eggs, then he will quickly fertilize them. There is, uh, oh, by the way, these wood frogs that we saw in Ohio mating, we also saw masses of eggs. It was unbelievable the amount of eggs we saw in these tiny little kind of pools of water in some areas. I just want to show you a picture of that. There are just hundreds of eggs in each. Here's like one egg mass. There might be 500 eggs in that egg mass. And then look at how many egg masses there just are everywhere in here. So this is just one tiny little ephemeral pond that is going to dry up eventually. Crazy, huh? 
In any case, <clears throat> there is a fun story with frogs. Uh, sometimes we have in frog populations sneaker males. So typically, uh, females prefer males that are calling with deeper calls and louder calls. These are bigger males. Females prefer them. So a male will be calling away and then a fe uh, to attract a female to his area. Now, some small males are kind of tricky. They know they aren't going to get a mate by calling. They're too small. So what they'll do is they'll be sneakers. They'll just wait right near a big male and they'll just quietly wait until a female approaches the big male who's calling beautifully away. When the female approaches, the little guy will jump on top of the female and um, grab on an amplexus. And the poor female now has been kind of fooled. She now is going to mate with this little guy, the sneaker male, but the sneaker males happen. Anyway, external fertilization requires um, um, a, a wet environment <laughs> because otherwise the gametes will dry out and requires timing. Internal fertilization, on the other hand, um, is important particularly in terrestrial animals where uh, gametes could dry out, right? So most terrestrial animals use internal fertilization but it has some requirements. Um, one of them is cooperative behavior, right? Yeah, you have to cooperate to use internal fertility. You can't just drop your eggs anywhere and drop your sperm somewhere. You need cooperation, and that requires um, a lot of courtship rituals, things of that nature. You see in the spring, you'll see um, birds doing, engaging in, in displays and in, in courtship displays and courtship behaviors and eventually mating. Birds are kind of cool because they don't have... Um, the males don't have a penis in birds. They just have kind of what's called a general area of their body called a cloaca, where they release their sperm. And so what they have to do is kind of like smush their cloacas together. If you've ever seen birds mating, it doesn't take very long. But they'll smush their cloacas together and the male will release his sperm. Second requirement of internal fertilization would be um, uh, some sort of um, structural adaptations for the receiving of sperm and the delivering of sperm. For most animals, that is a copulatory organ, a penis of some type. Like I said, birds are kind of funky that way. Um, in any case, that's it. So um, several different kinds of requirements for different types of fertilization, but um, all critical for success. Okay, we're going to move to part two, but I'm stopping here and we'll move into part two in the next video. And we'll see you later.